In tonight's Your Health segment, Dr. Simon Chattervedi, Professor of Neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Director of the Stroke Program for the University of Maryland Medical System. Doctor, thanks for being with us. Thank you. We want to focus on AFib, which is atrial fibrillation. Big words, what does that mean? Atrial fibrillation refers to an abnormal uh, heartbeat. And so uh, in the normal heart, there's an upper chamber uh, called the atrium and a lower chamber called the ventricle. And there's supposed to be a coordinated signal uh, from the upper chamber to the lower chamber. And in atrial fibrillation, instead of being coordinated, uh, it's uh, very chaotic. And so for you can imagine that uh, if there was an on-ramp to a highway, uh, one car should get on at a time. Uh, but imagine what would happen if 10 cars tried to get on at one time. It, things would be pretty chaotic. And so that's uh, somewhat of a, an analogy to atrial fibrillation, uh, that the uh, beating of the upper chamber is not well coordinated, and a lot of different signals are trying to get through. I understand millions of people have this, and some of them don't know they have it. Uh, that's correct. Uh, currently in the United States, there are about uh, 3 million people who have a AFib. And uh, some, uh, but there are, are, are other patients who don't know that they have it. And one important thing is that you may have heard that there are 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every day. And so AFib is strongly linked with the aging of the population. And so there are projections that the number of patients with AFib is going to double in the coming decades. The people who have it don't know they have it. Are they ignoring something or are there no symptoms? Sometimes there can be symptoms, and for example, uh, the normal heart rate is uh, 60 to 100, uh, but with AFib, sometimes the heart rate can become quite rapid. It could become 150, maybe even 175. And so if it, if it starts to become rapid, patients may develop a fluttering in their chest, they may feel short of breath, uh, they may have palpitations, uh, they may feel uh, excessively fatigued. And so those are some of the potential symptoms. Uh, but then there are other patients who don't really have any symptoms, and yet they, have, uh, they go in and out of AFib. So they may have it for five minutes or half an hour, and then their heart goes back to a normal rhythm. And so those cases are uh, some of the ones where it's uh, less well detected. And it's important to know, because uh, the irregular heartbeat comes along with a risk of stroke. Uh, correct. What's the connection? Yeah, so when the uh, upper chamber of the heart is not uh, beating properly and if it's not uh, coordinating with the lower chamber, uh, then if the blood just sits there, uh, you can imagine like a, a stagnant pool of water. And so when the, the blood just sits there, it's more likely to form a clot. And then if those uh, clots uh, get dislodged, uh, they can travel up to the brain and uh, block the blood flow to the brain, and that can lead to a potentially very serious stroke. And I've read it's, it's, uh, it tends to be among the most serious kinds of strokes. Yes. Uh, the uh, blood clots from atrial fibrillation, they tend to uh, lodge in like some of the bigger blood vessels leading up to the brain. Uh, and so because of that, uh, the corresponding strokes that they can cause tend to be larger on the whole and that can be associated with higher rates of disability and even death following a stroke. So what, what should people be aware of here? Uh, so there are several things. Uh, number one, if you've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, you need to uh, know what are some of the potential hazards. And so the potential hazards are sort of in two categories. Uh, one relates to the heart, uh, because uh, if the heartbeat is going too fast, as I said, it can cause shortness of breath, it can lead to heart failure. Uh, and, and then the other major hazard is the risk of stroke. And so it's very important that uh, patients who know that they have AFib, that they uh, be put on uh, blood thinners, uh, especially if they're higher risk for stroke. And so they need to discuss with their physician or their cardiologist uh, whether it's appropriate for them to be on blood thinners, uh, because blood thinners are extremely effective at reducing the risk of stroke, uh, and yet they're still uh, very underutilized across the country. There have been studies that only about 40 to 50 percent of the people with AFib who should be on blood thinners are actually getting them in the real world. Why would they not be getting them? Because they haven't seen a provider or, or the, there's, there's an issue with there being a risk of being on the, the blood thinner? Uh, th there are several potential reasons. One is that they may not see a physician regularly, uh, but another one is that sometimes uh, uh, the communication between the physician and the patient is not optimal. And sometimes the physician may think that aspirin is uh, sufficient for AFib because aspirin is a fairly weak blood thinner. Uh, but, on the, uh, but the studies clearly show that aspirin is not really that effective for preventing stroke with AFib. 
and that's why you need to be on stronger blood thinners such as uh, warfarin or there are some newer medications these days such as uh, dabigatran, apixaban, rivaroxaban. Those are some of the medications. And the people that, that uh, unfortunately wind up in, in your care at the various hospitals having suffered a, a stroke, um, you see people who could have been helped by one of those drugs. Yes, that's uh, something which is very heartbreaking to all uh, neurologists probably across the country when we see somebody come in with a large stroke with atrial fibrillation uh, when we think that it could have easily been prevented if they had been on uh, proper blood thinning medication. Let's take a phone call. Carroll County, uh, this is Jim. Jim, thank you for the call. Go ahead. Jim, are you there? Yes, I'm What's your here. question? Thank you. Uh, I'm 79 years old. I've been treated for AFib for six years, roughly. I'm taking Maltac, Renexa, and Eliquis for controlling the occasional AFib. I'm considering RF ablation. Uh, how effective is that, and does the AFib usually come back? Jim, great okay. question. Best of luck, sir. Thank you for the phone call. Yeah, so what the caller was referring to is uh, something called cardiac ablation. And so uh, some cardiologists who specialize in abnormal heart rhythms, they can do a procedure uh, where they try to uh, zap the tissue, which is causing the abnormal firing. And zap is uh, not a technical term, but they, uh, that, that's the goal of the ablation is to try to eradicate the area which is firing abnormally, and then hopefully you can uh, prevent the AFib from reoccurring. And it's uh, fairly successful. Uh, it can help uh, in terms of relieving symptoms, uh, such as shortness of breath. Uh, and, but in some patients, it can uh, come back after the ablation procedure. So in general, about five years after the ablation, maybe 30% of the AFib has come back. Mike uh, on the line from Cecil County. Mike, thank you for calling. Uh, what's your question? Um, how is, uh, is there a relationship between AFib and exercise? Interesting. Like uh, cardiovascular, on the treadmill, et cetera. Mike, thank you very much. Yeah, no, that's an interesting question because there's uh, more and more research about how lifestyle changes can reduce your risk of AFib. And uh, AFib can be linked with a number of conditions, including uh, obesity, uh, sleep apnea, uh, hypertension. And so if somebody exercises regularly, and especially if they're able to uh, lose some weight, uh, that could be helpful in uh, decreasing the number of episodes of AFib they have and uh, what's referred to as the overall uh, AFib burden. What about coffee? We once talked about some link between people who have these gigantic cups of high-strength coffee mm -hmm. and, and an AFib episode. Yeah, regular consumption of coffee, like the average person, if they have, like, uh, say, two to four cups a day, that's probably not a, a major contributor. Uh, but on the other hand, as you s said, if somebody has like uh, uh, a large uh, slug of an uh, uh, energy drink with a lot of stimulants, uh, that can definitely uh, trigger abnormal heartbeats and, and also a rapid heartbeat. Let's get to a quick call from Prince George's County. This is Oaken. Thank you for the call. Go ahead. Yes. Your question. Question is, what... Uh, what kind of blood pressure medicine should we avoid because some of the blood pressure prescription medicine causes AP? Interesting. Thank you very much. Is that the case? Uh, some blood pressure medications can actually be useful for uh, controlling the heart rate. And so, for example, there's a, a category called uh, beta blockers, which uh, slow down the heart rate. And so those actually could be beneficial uh, for some patients with AFib as long as they don't have other reasons that they can't take beta blockers. Let's end with the, the most important thing, which is getting people who are having a stroke rapidly into a medical center that can take care of them quickly, the symptoms that people should look out for. Yeah, so the major symptoms they should watch out for are a weakness of one side of the body, uh, speech problems, uh, sudden onset of unexplained dizziness, uh, facial droop. Uh, and so if you have any of those symptoms, uh, especially if you're in the first, uh, s within six hours, it's best to go to the emergency room right away. Uh, but e these days uh, there have been breakthroughs so that even some patients can be treated within 24 hours of the stroke. Very good. Uh, Dr. Chatterbetti, University of Maryland School of Medicine, sir, thank you very much. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.